learned most of what he knew from the suffragists. He uh, subscribed to three different London newspapers so he could keep up with their actions because they were such great strategists. Um, they were also loved by their movement, and this is something we don't see that much anymore. Um, the left now has this terrible tendency to cannibalize its leaders. I think this goes right back to those adolescent values, that knee-jerk against all authority. This was not always the case, though. Um, so here's Emmeline talking to a crowd. The, thing, the lengths that people went to to protect her, because the police were always trying to rearrest her, because they knew if they could destroy the leadership, they would bring the movement down. Christabel, her daughter, actually spent two years in Paris, um, running the movement from Paris in exile, because she didn't want to get arrested again. Um, but Emmeline, there's just, just great stories. They knew what the parade route was down to where she was going to be speaking, so they knew she'd be traveling that route. And the police went to every single house. This is a, you know, a poor section of London. They went to every single house and offered them like 100 pounds. We let us set up in the front, the front room and arrest her when she comes by. Not a single house would take the money. It was just incredible amounts of loyalty to these people. So. Resistance movements need that infusion of you know, the young, the moral vigor, the courage. Um, we don't get anywhere without that. But they also need the experience, the stability, and the material resources of the people who are you know, middle-aged and older. Um, and the take-home point, really, is that successful resistance movements are always multi-generational. You've got to have both. Um, if you break the natural bonds between the young and the old, it means that political wisdom never, never accumulates. So you never learn what you need to learn. And what it means now is that the young are not being socialized into a culture of resistance. What they're being socialized into is this absolutely toxic culture created by corporate America, which has everything to gain by destroying our capacity for community, uh, never mind our, community f or our capacity for resistance. So a few simple questions here. Are we after shock value or are we after justice? Um, is the problem a constraining set of values or an oppressive set of material conditions? Um, are we content to coexist alongside you know, the state of things with all the horrors that are going on? Are we content to just coexist in our own little bubble, no matter how repelled we are by those horrors? Um, and is the self really an appropriate long-term project? Or could we move on to something a little bit bigger now? Because another 200 species went extinct today, and they were my kin. What we need is organized political resistance. So. The task of an activist is not to navigate around these systems of oppression with as much personal integrity as possible. It's to dismantle those systems. And this is where we've gone wrong. To get to a real resistance, we're going to need that culture, the culture of resistance. Instead, what we have, you know, I call this the permaculture wing, right? Not that I've got anything against permaculture. <laughs> But the permaculture, you know, the transition town, the voluntary simplicity people, I actually call them the oin bees, only in my backyard. Um, taken as a whole, they dismiss political action as impractical or impossible. And this is a very bad habit that the left is going to have to break if we're going to get anywhere. We are the people who should be shouting from every rooftop and from every street corner. Not only is resistance possible, failure is impossible given what's at stake. So let's pretend for a minute, thought experiment. We are in Nazi-occupied France. We are in US-occupied Vietnam. We are in US-occupied North America. <laughs> Um, does anybody really want to suggest that riding bikes and buying organic shampoo would drive them out? Yet, this is the strategy that the left seems to be suggesting. Um, I know that it's really hard to name a, a perpetrator. Um, it's certainly hard to name the perpetrators of, of global destruction, and there's a, a lot against us in this. But they do have names and addresses, as Utah Phillips famously pointed out, and more important, the infrastructure of industrial civilization is incredibly vulnerable, and that's a point to which we will return in a minute. Um, so how would a resistance movement be organized? Well, across history, it's, you've got pretty much the same pattern. You've got the one side that's just the tasks of the culture of resistance. They, their job is to build the new institutions that can take over and will organize the new, better society as the old one comes down in whatever way. And then on the other side, you've got these combatants that are doing the actual frontline resistance. They're doing the direct confrontations with power. Now, I want to be very clear. When I say combatants, that does not have to mean violence. Okay? Nonviolence and violence are not the distinctions here. Um, this distinction is really between doing something and doing nothing. Um, between fighting power in whatever way, naming power and fighting it, doing that confrontation, and submitting to power. Those are the main distinctions. From there, we can make other distinctions, we can make other decisions, but those come later. You've got to decide first that you're actually going to do something. So we need lots and lots of people to do that standard work that cultures of resistance do. The local economies, the participatory democracy, um, systems of justice that we can all agree to. I would say character building towards self-respect, breaking that identification you know, with the overlords, and then direct support for the front lines. So you know, loyalty and whatever materials we can come up with. All right, here's the truth. The vast majority of people are not going to resist shit. And I think that we just have to accept that. 
Um, I thought that a lot when I was in my 20s. I fought and fought and fought. I fought with everybody I could fight with. There's no point. Most people simply don't have it in them. Um, of those that do, it's still only 2% that are needed for those frontline positions. And that's true in regular armies. Only 2% of the US military actually has a combat role. The other 98% do support. It was true in the IRA. Only 2% of those guys ever picked up weapon. The other 98%, and it was a huge range of people, you know, there were 10-year-olds who carried messages. I mean, it was an amazing mobilization. But 98% of those people did support. Most people do not have the personality to do the direct, for the frontline stuff, um, or they can't take the risks for lots and lots of legitimate reasons. If you've got kids, you're pretty much out of the picture. If you've got aging parents who need you, you can't do this, you know? We have responsibilities, human responsibilities. So it's mostly going to be young people who don't have you know, a lot of kind of responsibilities yet on their plates who can take this up, and you find that all over. Um, the last 40 minutes of this, though, the last, the last 40 years of my life, really, um, this has been for those of you who are the 2%, because I know you're here, and you're really the ones that I want to talk to. We need warriors who will put themselves between what is left of this planet and fossil fuel, okay? We need to stop industrial civilization. Now, if we had the numbers, we could do that using nonviolence. I mean, we could shut this party down by midnight using human blockades. Um, I don't see the numbers. I would love to be wrong. I would vastly prefer to wage this struggle using nonviolence, but I don't see the numbers. Um, my longing will not bring them forth, and it's a little late in the day for millennialism. So given a realistic assessment of what we actually have, the only strategy that I can see that can be effective is direct attacks on infrastructure. In very blunt terms, we need to stop them. Now, this is not a game for children, and this revolution is not for the hell of it. We need a serious underground movement that has the discipline, the training, the command structure, and the strategic savvy to coordinate decisive attacks on a continental scale, and we needed it yesterday. And it would be really great if the permaculture wing would get on board and at least provide the loyalty and material support. Um, but the smallest thing they can do is to stop saying that this can't be done. It can. The only real question is why aren't we doing it? And I hate that part of the answer may be that we are the people who benefit from this repulsive arrangement of power. And that makes it hard. Mm -hmm.